So first we'll be uh, hearing from uh, Emeritus Professor of Animal Welfare at Cambridge University's Department of Veterinary Medicine, uh, Dr. Don Broom. Uh, Dr. Don Broom works on the scientific assessment of animal welfare, cognitive abilities of animals, ethics and sustainable farming. He has been the chairman or vice chairman of several committees on animal welfare in the European Union and has several publications on the topics of stress, the evolution of morality, animal sentience, and many others. Um, so Dr. Broom, thank you so much for joining us. Okay, so I'm sharing my screen, I hope. Uh, you should be able to see it okay now. Is it okay? Yes, do you want to put your slides in presenter mode? Oh, uh, great. No. Is it there? Yes. You can yes. hear me? Yes. And you can see it, okay. Right. Okay, fine. Right, well, uh, first of all, it's very good to be part of this uh, event. And uh, I, I have to say that uh, up until the, I, I, I ran a large uh, animal welfare science research group until I retired. And over uh, 30 years of doing that, we hardly ever got any funding from anybody for looking at wild animal welfare. We did do a number of projects. They were mainly projects done by students which didn't need a lot of funding uh, for undergraduate students and so on. And, and I was involved in quite a lot of questions about wild animal welfare, but nobody was funding anything. So it's 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 good that we are uh, it's good that more things are being done now, and I'm very pleased that the Wild Animal Initiative is doing what it's doing. So let me start by asking a very simple question. What are the greatest problems in the world at the moment? Uh, well, I would say that for humans, it's probably antimicrobial resistance because we are getting increasing numbers of bacteria which are resistant to antibiotics uh, and uh, anti other antimicrobials. And uh, that may well be a very the, the biggest problem for humans. Uh, tu tuberculosis is already killing more people per year than COVID uh, has done in the last few years. So, OK, there's a problem. Uh, climate change is a major problem for humans, as, as it is for the rest of the world. And I do think that we as humans are failing to use world resources in a good way. Uh, and that's probably the third thing. And all the other things that are talked about in the world, like terrorism and wars and so on, uh, starvation, they are less important than those things in my view. Okay, that's humans. Let's look at the world in general. I think the biggest problem in, for the world in general is that a lot of human action is harmful to many other uh, components of the world and is causing widespread death and suffering. And so I think that's the number one problem for the, the whole world. And climate change is also a very major problem for the, for the whole world. Okay, so there's some something to provoke you. You may or may not agree with that, but there is a question of what whatever you think is the most important thing, what should individual do about these world problems? And the most important thing is we can do something. Everybody can do something. So we need to think about the, globally about the whole world we need to try and assess the problems and we need to, to, to um, take it very seriously, but you have to act locally where you are yourself. Uh, but every individual can do something. So we should be thinking about doing something about these major problems in the world. And it is the case that public attitudes are changing substantially uh, as to what we should do and what we shouldn't do. And uh, science, tells everybody that there is only one biology, there is only one welfare, there is only one health. These concepts of, uh, are the same concepts, whatever species you're talking about. Um, why is it not going forward? Should be going forward when I do that and it hasn't moved, let's try this. Oh, that did it. Okay, so uh, this the, uh, the word health, means the same thing whether we're talking about a human or a non-human animal. Uh, the, bio the basic biology of all organisms, or humans and all others, are the same. Everybody knows this, but we still have a tendency to act as if things which affect humans are different in some way. There is also a tendency for most people in the world not to think that humans are animals. 
And to use the word animal as if humans are not part of it. Uh, I, I think everybody listening to this probably knows that humans are animals, uh, but it is the case that many people don't think that. There is also a viewpoint that the whole world has been moving towards humans. We are, we are the end point of the world and we are very special in some way. Actually, when you look at ability, when you look at functioning, it's extremely difficult to find any kind of human ability which isn't present in at least one, some other species. Uh, and so the, the, the idea that humans are terribly important and everything else is not important is very damaging. And I th I'm quite sure from what Cam said at the beginning that, his, that the, the view of, the, of, of, of this, this organization is very similar. So anthropocentrism, the, the idea that the humans are the, humans are the center of the world and nothing much else matters, is actually the major cause of many of the world's problems. And that is something which needs to be better recognized. So there is, there is more recognition of what is happening in the world now than there was. The public has more information and the public is increasingly demanding a variety of changes. Uh, and I'm gonna come back to that. But uh, so sustainability is something which people talk about and sometimes people know what they're talking about, but everybody has an idea, which I think is probably a useful one about it. So this is what I mean by sustainability, that a, a system or procedure is sustainable and that depends on whether it's acceptable and whether what is likely to happen, expected to happen in the future is acceptable. And that's in relation to the use of resources the consequences of functioning, whether it's a moral action or not. And so some things are not sustainable. And there are lots of reasons why something may not be sustainable. Also, if we're talking about uh, uh, food production, then the quality of food, nowadays people are really thinking that the quality of food includes things like the ethics of production. So that if you produce something which is damaging the world, if which or which is damaging the welfare of individual animals which are involved in some way, then that is not good quality food. And that view, I think, is quite an important one. And all of this is part of a general change in the world economics. And that change is, <coughs> excuse me, that change is that until maybe 20 or 30 years ago, most products were produced by people without anybody quite knowing how they produced things. They knew something was known, but other things were not known. And so people, and then we started to get consumers avoiding certain products. So products of child labor was one of the first, uh, producing things by fair trade, where the people who do the work didn't get a very good return, but some big company did get a lot of good return. Uh, fair trade products became an important thing and changed what people bought. <coughs> Sorry, I'm coughing. Uh, so people actually went into supermarkets and refused to buy things because they weren't fair trade or because they thought it wasn't a moral way of doing things. And more and more recently, we've had um, people refusing to buy things because the welfare of the animals uh, involved in production was, was not good. So this is a significant change in how things work. The consumers have more effect now than they used to have. Right, forgive me if I'm if I'm coughing. Uh, uh, uh. So animal, uh, we've already had a comment on what animal means. I think it's important biologically that the world animal, the word animal, does refer to all kinds of animals, all vertebrates and all invertebrates. There is a tendency for people to use animal as if it means mammal, or to use animal if it means not human, and neither of those is biologically sound. So we shouldn't use the word animal to distinguish humans from other animals. Um, and we ought to include everything which is an animal. So animals living in the soil, uh, marine animals, they're all animals. And I think that's, it's, it's, that's an important thing to, to do. And there is a tendency for, among some people to use the word animal or the names of animals as a, as, as, as a, as a rude word, a pejorative term. And I don't think that's a good thing either. So uh, what, what, uh, what do people think is the value of individual animals of various kinds? Um, some people would say, I like animals, but they like the ones which are most like humans. 
they least like the ones which are not much like humans or they like animals which are useful to humans or because of some other quality like to liking the big ones and not the small ones or the other way around or liking the beautiful ones or the clever ones or the rare ones uh, what is what is um, ethically acceptable what is value if we're talking about humans and what is value if we're talking about those individual animals themselves we ought to be thinking about that and <clears throat> my view is we should think about about value in a wider way than we do at the moment okay so should we use other kinds of animals non-human individuals in some way which is useful for humans is it wrong to kill animals or to <laughs> do something which results in the death of animals um, is it wrong to cause poor welfare in in other species of animals um, should humans kill non-human animals for any purpose should they kill them for food for fur for entertainment because we would refer to them as pests or be because we don't think they're they're very very attractive or useful <clears throat> uh, so in what circumstance is it reasonable to kill another species uh, should you kill should you kill animals when you drive down the road everybody does um in what sense is it immoral to do that and then another question is if you are going to kill an animal <clears throat> how should you do it and i think most people would say <clears throat> in that case well <laughs> sorry about that most people would say that it, the welfare of the animal is a very important thing and that applies to wild animals as it does to pet animals farm animals laboratory animals working animals okay <clears throat> so sustainability has a lot of different components and if you ask people very often they say that animal welfare is a key part of sustainability other people use welfare as if it's something different and nothing to do with sustainability but according to the definition which i put up <clears throat> of course uh, some, a system could be unsustainable because of the welfare of the animals um this goes back again to what cam was saying uh, I use welfare for all animals. It ha there has to be a nervous system which controls the interactions with the environment. Um, if there isn't a nervous system, I wouldn't use the word animal. So, it's, so a plant is not an animal and an in inanimate object is, is by definition not an animal. Um, and the definition of welfare that I've used for many years is, that, is what is written up there. The welfare of an individual's state as regards its attempts to cope with its environment. And that applies to all kinds of animals but if the if the animal is sentient then there is a slight difference and i'll come to that come to that so welfare then um includes uh positive and negative it's not just the positive it varies over a range and it's something we can measure if you can measure welfare then it must be that you measure how much better or how much worse it is and we have lots of scientific measures we have scientific measures of the needs of animals and we have scientific measures of what is the actual state of the individual at, at a particular moment health is a key part of this health is an important part of welfare and <clears throat> it shouldn't be regarded as something separate from welfare health is is to is to do with the uh, uh what extent to which the individual can cope with pathology and pathology is one of the very big negatives for all species of animal so understanding about health is a very important thing in relation to welfare another thing which is important is feelings positive and negative feelings and everything that which which we call feelings and there's a list of some things that we call feelings there all of the things that we call call feelings are actually to some degree adaptive biological mechanisms if you don't have a pain system then it's going to make it more difficult to avoid things which damage your tissues and that you can argue it in the same way for all the other things that we call feelings <clears throat> so feelings are not accidental things which are different from other coping mechanisms they are things which are a part of all the coping mechanisms that individuals have so feelings positive and negative are a really important aspect of uh, the welfare of individuals and that applies to all individuals humans and all others so we are able to assess welfare and uh, I, so when 
when I started to work on animal welfare, which is actually 40 years ago, uh, nobody could get any research funds for animal welfare. It wasn't just the wild animals. You couldn't get any anything. Uh, and that so there's been a considerable change. And probably 40 years ago, there were only about 30 people who would have called themselves welfare scientists. And now there are probably about 4000 who would. So there's a really big change. Uh, and we've got lots of measures which are being used. And I'm not going to try to go through and explain the, the assessment of welfare, because I know that's part of the things that you're going to do. But if you're thinking about a situation, for example, an animal is caught in a snare or a trap. What's the effect on the welfare of the animal? We've got things which we can measure. We've got measures of behavior, a range of different measures of behavior. What does the animal do when it confronted with a, with a major problem? Uh, which might be caught, being caught in a trap or it might be being injured by being being shot or being having something else done done to it. Or it might be just that it's kept in a small box and it can't get out of it. So behavior, there's a whole lot of behavior measurement. And there's a whole lot of physiological measurement. And both of these are really useful in evaluating what the individual is having to do in order to try to cope with the environment in which it finds itself. And we need to have the behavior, we need to have the physiology, we need to have the health measures, how much body damage is there, how much is there actual damage to the functioning of the individual, some of that may be measurable physiologically, some of it we look at it in terms of myopathy and such like. So we can measure positive and negative welfare, we can evaluate what is the balance, the net welfare, the balance between the two, um, the balance might be a net negative and we can say how negative it is. And that is something which has developed. Those skills have developed a great deal. But as you pointed out earlier, they haven't been used very much for wild animals. And when I've been trying to evaluate sustainability of, of food production systems, I immediately come to a problem that we have a lot of information, for example, about the welfare of farm animals treated in different ways, kept in different conditions and so on. And we have hardly anything about the effects of plant growing plants on wild animals. And there are really some really negative effects. And there are also some positive effects of, of systems for producing plants. But we don't know much about those. We don't know. There are a lot of things we don't know about the welfare of a whole wide range of wild animals. And some of this is to do with pests, and some of it is to do with soil animals, and some of it is to do with the consequences of clearing areas for agriculture and so on. So there are lots of consequences. We don't know very much about the extent of the consequences for the, for the wild animals. Then what is the worst welfare? Well, if you think about pain, which most people think is a bad thing, or fear, which when you think about it carefully is very often a worse thing than pain, it, 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 how bad it is depends to some extent on how long it goes on. And this uh, initial plot here, which is a plot of the intensity of the effect, which might be negative or positive against time, that was originally done for, for a system which was saying if wild animals are going to be killed, for example, by shooting or trapping or poisoning, then how? what's the intensity of the effect? How negative is it if it's like those three things? And how long does it go on? And you actually need to look at the time course of the effect in order to evaluate systems, in order to say this method is worse than this method or this method is better than that method. And it's this. And so what you do is you plot it and you uh, assuming you have the data to do this and then you measure the area under that curve. So this is really just saying that the uh, intensity has to be plot, has to be considered in relation to time and not just intensity by itself. So sometimes time is neglected. So something which something which is really bad and goes on for a long time is worse than something which is really bad and is rather brief. Well, that's obvious, isn't it? But we ought to be doing that in our measurement of effects on other species. And if the effect is positive, it's the same thing. OK, so the welfare of all animals can be assessed, but People generally want to protect sentient animals more, and this is because of what they can appreciate of the world in which they live. So what's sentience? Sentience means having the awareness and cognitive ability necessary to have feelings. So does this kind of animal at this stage in its life have that awareness and cognitive ability? Can it have 
feelings, which may be positive or negative. We really want to know that. And different species, species differ, and the data we have has different consequences. So if you uh, if you um, if you look at look at a sheep and you record from the brain, then you can find out that the sheep has a mechanism for recognizing individual sheep and indeed individual humans. And so we, we have information from a variety of studies. We also have information from experimental studies. The, the picture of the pig and the mirror is because we did a study to try to find out whether pigs could use information from a mirror. And we found that they could. And so after after we gave them five hours of experience with a mirror, and they then were able to um, use that information about what was a mirror. Excuse me again. Also, there are lots of studies of social behavior, which give you information about the awareness uh, uh, functioning of, of individuals. Um, and we, are, we, we finish up by looking at a range of different kinds of animals and saying, how complex is their cognitive ability? What evidence do we have that they are able to appreciate what is happening to them? And uh, some, and so I'll come back to it, but some can do it better than others. I'm sorry about the coughing. So, uh, not all humans are sentient. A fertilized human egg, or in fact, or if you like, a fertilized fish egg, is not sentient, but then it develops and it becomes a sentient being. Also, there are individual humans whose brain has been damaged to the point where they are, they no longer have the capacity. And so, uh, but they're still, they're still individuals who most of us would say are of value, but uh, they have lost some of the ability. <coughs> Sorry, I didn't realize my coughing was going to interfere so much. Um, understanding the biology of a species is very valuable in terms of working out what that kind of animal needs and how they control their lives. You have to have studies of, of, of motivation in order to do that sort of thing. So animals had obvious needs for resources like food and water and a particular temperature. They also have needs for um, things which they need to do in, in the course of their normal life, like foraging in the ground in order to find food. The foraging itself is important, not just getting the food. Building a nest when about to lay an egg or give birth. So how should animals be protected? Well, the, the laws which we have in most countries about uh, animals which are kept say that if you keep animals, you have a duty of care for them or some words like that. And that's an important thing to have. So we would say that we have a duty of care whenever we are keeping an animal. Do we have a duty of care for a wild animal? I would say we don't have the duty of care for a wild animal because we're not um, looking after its every everyday situation. <laughs> but we do have duties in relation to our impact on the animal. Right, so uh, in talking about sentience, we know that we have a lot of information in recent years about a range of species, and I'm just going to say, give a few examples quite quickly uh, the, as to what what can be done. So here, no. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> okay, so jays are members of the crow family. They they find food, they hide it. And then they find it again later. What Nikki Clayton and her group found, which was very interesting, was that if they hid a peanut, that they would hide the peanut and then come back and get it. Sometimes months later, they would come back to the same place and get the peanut. But if they hid a mealworm, they always came back within two days. In other words, they have a concept of the future for that particular object. If, if I leave it, it's going to go bad. I have to go back within two days. Also, if when they hid it, somebody else was watching, say another J, 
then they would return and hide it somewhere else. Um, here's another, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna get some water, I'm sorry. Don, if you need, you can take a minute. Yes, of course, when you uh, when you're giving a lecture in a lecture theatre, they often give you some water. Uh, if, if you're at home, you don't think about. It. I didn't. Okay, so. Here, here are a couple of interesting studies showing that uh, animals other than humans can count. So crows were trained and they could respond to the numbers of dots on an object and they distinguish between one and eight dots. Uh, they also could learn that a particular Arabic numeral represented a certain number of dots. Uh, also, if they were given dots, they could add them up and respond to the sum of the number of dots. They could translate that into Arab Arabic, Arabic numerals as well. Their drinking is not the solution. Not the only one. Right, so here's another study. Uh, clean a rat on a coral reef, clean parasites from big fish. They select, they, 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 the, the fish queue up to be cleaned. Uh, but sometimes they get occasional visitors who don't know the rules about waiting in a queue to be cleaned by the cleaner fish. And what the cleaner rats do is that they, they choose the occasional visitors before the regular ones, because if they don't, the occasional visitors go away. And if you give them a permanent food source or an ephemeral food source, in an experiment, they do the same thing. Uh, these rats can learn within 10 trials to go for the ephemeral food rather than the permanent food. Uh, if you do that with humans, they take uh, quite a few trials to learn it. Um, Capuchin monkeys took over 100 trials, chimpanzees and orangs took 50 to 100 trials or sometimes didn't, didn't learn it. <laughs> um, it was also done with um, parrots. Parrots were just as good as the fish at learning it. So in this particular task, uh, this fish species and parrots were better than most, than all the primates which were tested. And even humans didn't always do as well as the fish. Okay, this is just saying that in some kinds of tasks that other kinds of animals may be quite good. <laughs> uh, there have been lots of studies on cephalopods, on, on octopus, squid, uh, cuttlefish. They can learn mazes, they can use flexible route planning, they can identify individual humans and individuals of their own species, they have individual differences. Uh, they can show simultaneous responses on the two halves of this is a couple fish, two halves of their body so that they have one message to one side and one message to the other side. We can't do that. So they can also carry out deception for their own benefit. So this is just saying they're pretty clever. They can do quite a lot of things. Uh, hermit crabs can remember which shells they previously investigated. Crabs and other crustace crustaceans can show avoidance learning. Uh, spiny lobsters were displaced really a long way on the seabed and they they found the, their home location. They went back directly to their home where, where they had come from. They must have measured, they must have remembered the magnetic and visual details of that in order to be able to do it as fast as they did. They've also got quite rapid and complex learning in spiders, bees and ants. What about pain and other feelings. Well, in decapods, in prawns, who's, who, who have something done which damages their antennae, uh, they change their movements and uh, they don't change it if they've had an anesthetic. Uh, crabs could learn to avoid shocks. Hermit crabs uh, learn to leave a place where something nasty happened to them very readily, uh, but they can do it by trading off the preference and the negative experience. So this is the kind of information which has led us to say that there are pain systems in uh, decapod crustacea, all vertebrates and cephalopod mollusks, 
uh, <laughs> the, the pain system is very clear in fish um, and pretty good evidence in, in the cephalopods. Uh, human pain research often uses swimming gastropods as a model for <clears throat> testing painkillers. But we don't have very much evidence from insects and spiders. So, OK, this is going into some detail about the concept of sentience. And the current conclusion is that all vertebrates are sentient. Cephalopod mollusks and decapod crustaceans are. And it might be that some of the others are, but we haven't got there yet. We have more sent, more protection of our laws give more protection to sentient animals than those that aren't sentient. But there are lots of sentient animals which are hardly protected at all. Uh, you will be aware that fish caught on the seabed are not protected. Okay, so we do know something about what pain and fear are. We know the components of the pathways. Uh, we know the inhibitors in the pain pathways. What are the physiological and behavioral responses? And we know that uh, we, we we do know quite a lot about what individuals need, firstly, in relation to avoidance of negative things like pain, and secondly, in relation to what are the resources of their environment, which are very important to them. And understanding about needs is the first step in devising a, a mechanism for protecting that particular species. Uh, the five freedoms and five domains idea is a good general guide, but in the end, you need to have good quality scientific studies of the needs of that particular kind of animal. In some cases, we haven't got that, and we have to use evidence from other animals and uh, or, or the general guidelines only. Okay, so having said something about, about uh, welfare and things that we can measure, I'm just going to go through and mention a few particular uh, examples of studies. Uh, I'm going to use the word humane, which uh, I encountered the need to define humane when I was dealing with uh, leg hold traps, uh, the, representing the EU on a committee in which we were looking at whether leg hold traps could be humane. Um, so that meant we had to know what it meant. And killing methods, if you're going to, if animals are going to be killed, then are there procedures which are humane? Well, of course, you might say that you shouldn't kill anything, and it's not humane to kill anything. But if something is going to be killed, then what are the procedures which are the best ones in terms of welfare? Uh, basically, you need to have a procedure which doesn't cause poor welfare. The animal might die, but of course, welfare ends when the animal dies. Welfare is a a characteristic of living animals and a dead animal doesn't have any welfare uh, so if you can kill it without it knowing that it's being killed then that's better than if you uh, if you cause it a lot of suffering on the way there and uh, I again I encountered this because there were there was a lot of discussion about hunting deer and foxes with dogs and the people who were doing the hunting said oh they really enjoy it the deer love being love running in front of the dogs and it's uh, they're very happy about it, but actually when you measure it, it's pretty evident that they don't. Uh, what about shooting? If you shoot a, an animal, you may kill it instantaneously, in which case there is no poor welfare. The animal goes from being alive and functioning well to being dead with no period of poor welfare. Usually there's a bit of poor welfare, but uh, it might be very, very brief. It might be just a few seconds, or it might be many weeks of pain. So we ought to be able to distinguish between those when, when something's going to be killed by shooting or any other method. And if you, if you shoot at night, it's often inaccurate. If you shoot from boats, it's often inaccurate because of movement of the boat and so on. Trapping and poisons, which trap, are there humane traps? Well, the answer is mostly no, because most of the things which we use as traps, there's quite a long period of suffering before the animal is either released or dies. What about poisons? There is a very big range in poisons in what the effect on the animal which is being poisoned. So if you if if you if you use anticoagulant poisons for rodents, we know that there is a long period when they are suffering, but it varies with the actual anticoagulant how long it is. Uh, there are other poisons which kill quickly, 
But if, you, if so, it may be that it only takes a few seconds or a few minutes. In other cases, it takes uh, several days. And so we need to distinguish those when you're trying to say what is a, a reasonable thing to do and what is not. Catching a fish, what's the effect on the fish of being caught? Well, we know something about that as well. I, I was asked to do something about snares at one point. Uh, uh, that, well, a snare is a loop that the animal puts its head in or its foot in, and then it gets held and it can't get out. Some of them are restraining snares. A few of them are killing snares. The size of the loop is designed for the target species, but something else might get caught. And what happens then? Usually something much worse happens if it's something else, some other species. Uh, they have self-locking tabs. Is that better or not better? Uh, well, it's sometimes better and sometimes it's worse. Uh, so we need to look at the kinds of injuries which occur and how painful those injuries are in order to evaluate something like a snare. And generally speaking, it shows that there's a lot of very poor welfare in uh, animals caught in snares. Uh, and it hardly ever makes the animal go unconscious within five minutes. So five minutes of sometimes very uh, great suffering. Nobody really thinks of that as a really of, as a as a humane killing method. Uh, well, some people do, but uh, 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 well, I don't. OK, and if you catch the wrong species, then it may take a lot longer uh, and therefore be much worse. And so you have uh, you have consequences of catching the wrong thing. So unselective trapping methods are bad things. Uh, the, this is, is some of the evidence. It's saying the same thing. I think I'll just say it very briefly here. But that there's a lot of evidence that these snares can cause a lot of suffering uh, and they vary. Some are worse than others. And so you can have a, a high magnitude of poor welfare in, in, in snares. So in general, snares are not good things is the, is the message from these sorts of studies. Uh, and, and another experience which I had was that I was asked if I would uh, go to the international to a subcommittee group of the International Whaling Commission because uh, they, the International Whaling Commission had always refused to have the word welfare mentioned at any of its meetings and they refused for 30 years or something like that, a long time. And then uh, the, 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 in fact, the UK, sometimes the UK does good things. The UK delegation said we ought to be talking about welfare. So I was asked if I would try and do something about it. And the question was, is whaling something which is humane or not? Should we accept whaling or should we not? Well, then you have to say, well, what are all the components of catching a, a whale, putting a harpoon into it usually? Um, well, the first thing is that they... Do they have a pain system? Well, people used to say that they didn't because they had very thick blubber and therefore they didn't have a pain system. Unbelievable. The people also said this about cows. Cows have thick skin and therefore they don't feel pain. But then if you observe cows, you can see that when they're bitten by a mosquito, they jump. So that, that seems to disprove the idea that thick skin prevents pain. Uh, so being large doesn't mean no pain. Uh, so whales are sentient animals, and I think everybody has accepted that for quite a long time. So what are the negative things about whaling, about catching whales? The effects of the human activity on the whales is one thing, and that actually is something which you have to take into account if you have whale watching. What are the effects of the human boats and so on? Then uh, sometimes in order to do this, you need to have survey work. Uh, what, what are the consequences of tissue sampling or marking procedures on whales? Uh, well, the answer is that there are consequences, but there, uh, there are it perhaps can be justified in some circumstances. Chasing a whale with a boat, they could, there would be fear, exhaustion, social disruption, uh, immunosuppression and disease, even if the whale got away. So there are negative aspects to the uh, chasing with a boat. Harpoon entry into tissues, that is going to involve pain, and then you're going to pull them in. But it might be a grenade harpoon, which explodes. Uh, if it goes in the right place, that might kill the whale immediately. If it doesn't go in the right place, it might cause a very large wound and not kill it immediately. 
pulling on a line attached to a harpoon. What does the whale think when it is being hauled in uh, by way of a harpoon which is sticking into it? Well, it will be more painful. It will, the whole thing would go on for a fair amount of time. Uh, there will be a lot of pain and fear. And what about when they're just about being pulled into a boat? Uh, the whale knows what's happening to it. It identifies the boat. It knows about boats. It knows about humans. So you can look at all these things and you can uh, say, how bad is it? And indeed, when is a whale unconscious? That's actually not an easy thing to do unless you have quite good information. OK, we need to if you're trying to kill something, you need to know when it's been killed. So is there a humane way of hunting whales? The answer is clearly no at the moment. And actually doing this kind of study helps to be able to say something like that in a convincing way. Uh, if you just say, obviously, it's not a good thing, then that isn't good enough. And what are the consequences of whaling for the countries which are still doing it? Well, they might be um, boycotts of their goods, not just the whaling goods, but everything they make. OK, stop buying all things made by countries which are still whaling. Well, that will have a lot of effect, wouldn't it? OK, here's another thing I was involved with, and that was uh, uh, what happens to seals. Well, seals are killed in order to get their skin. Uh, then, in, then the uh, European Union uh, did a large survey of the public and asked people what they thought about seal skins. And a surprisingly large number of the public knew how seals were caught and said they didn't like the idea of it. And they thought that it was bad for the welfare of the animals and that it shouldn't be allowed. And that was actually about 80 percent of the general public. So people were knew something about it. They weren't told about this, but they did know something about it. So the, the, the EU banned sealskin sales, and that was challenged in particular by Canada, who wanted to sell sealskin. And so we then had a meeting at the World Trade Organization in Geneva. And uh, I had the interesting experience of being, being in a room with uh, uh, 98 other people, uh, two of whom were scientists and 96 were lawyers. Um, lawyers were very pleasant, but uh, it was a strange, a strange situation to be in for an argument. Anyway, what happens to seals? Well, again, uh, you, you probably know something about how seals are caught uh, in, in, in Canada. They are, there are inspection systems, but they can't monitor things very, very well. Uh, the majority of the seals that are killed are pups between 12 days and three months of age. Uh, some of them are killed by being hit with a large club. Some of them are, uh, and, and that may, they, may, they may make the animal unconscious immediately, or they may miss and the animal may have to be hit more often, or they, the animal may react and jump into the water once it's been hit once and take three, three weeks to die. So herding and chasing seals, hitting them and missing, uh, this is all occurring in uh, on when the seals are on an ice flow. Um, the ice flows are moving around. Um, they're also killed by being shot. Uh, if you are on a boat with a gun and the seal is on an ice flow, then both can move. And so sometimes, the, even though people are very careful, they uh, it it takes more than one shot to kill the seal. So we have some uh, information uh, about these killing procedures and to what extent. Yes, 10 minutes. Thank you. That's fine. Uh, so does the animal become unconscious and does it recover consciousness before death? Those are the issues. And the answer is they sometimes uh, recover before death. They sometimes recover and are skinned while they're not dead. They sometimes uh, are uh, made unconscious and there is no other no negative effect apart from the fact they're being killed but they are uh, they are there, there isn't a lot of suffering so there's a big range between it being efficient and not being efficient uh, so the answer is that uh, in it's too high a risk to do it and that was the that was the message from uh, the uh, scientists who were presenting at this uh, meeting of the world trade organization and uh, yes, there's some more details of it here, but I'll, uh, I won't go through it any further. Uh, but just to say that uh, sometimes 
you get animals which are struck on the head or shot and then they jump into the water and sometimes uh, they're, they're killed rather quickly and sometimes they aren't. We know something about these things. So is there a humane and acceptable method of killing seals? The answer is that on, on land in well-controlled conditions, yes. So you could have an individual which is humanely killed. If they're in water or on ice, the risk of it going wrong is quite large. And so the answer is no. Uh, it's too often uh, too often bad for the seal. The welfare could be extremely poor. OK, so that's the end of the seals. I'll just say one more thing about, about badgers and tuberculosis, which is an issue in the UK at the moment. Uh, so back. Uh, tuberculosis is a disease of cattle, which was transmitted some years ago to badgers. Badgers can be infected by it and die. Uh, badgers also can transmit it. They don't very often transmit it to cattle, but that, so that's one of the questions. But they do occasionally do so. We don't actually know how often they do so, really. Um, they can do it by breathing on the cattle or the sputum being ingested by cattle or their urine or feces. Uh, in fact, Badgers avoid cattle in fields, and we did a study on that. Field contacts in the field are very rare. Almost all cattle strongly avoid being close to badger urine or feces, but they will occasionally do so, especially if the badger has visited a cattle food trough. So that's a possibility. Um, so we have some information then about, about this transmission and it is a very important thing for the whole cattle industry. It's bad for the welfare of cattle to get tuberculosis. It's bad for humans to some extent, although generally speaking, people are very careful about not getting bovine tuberculosis. Um, so uh, if it, it, it would be better to do it by a different method. The best method is to vaccinate the badgers. But uh, if you and if you shoot badgers, then they sometimes move around a lot more. And the result of that could be an increase in transmission, but they they don't move around more if they've been if they've been killed effectively. Okay, so this is another interesting area. Interactions between people and wild animals. Then there ought to be careful consideration of all of the impacts on the wild animals. There often aren't. The fishing industry is probably the worst in this respect. Uh, trawling, which is a completely non-selective method of catching fish, which sometimes involves 200 fish being caught and 10,000 animals dying because of the trawl. Is that reasonable? And so I would say, no, it's not. But it's a very widely used method at the moment. Um, the procedures used at the moment in relation to snares and killing whales and killing seals and killing badgers, uh, I would say that they are none of them sustainable. But you do, in order to persuade the world of this, you have to present a very careful argument. Uh, you've heard a little bit of it from what I've said, but I did had to do it rather, rather rapidly. But overall, we need to be investigating such things. We need to look at all human impacts on wild populations, and we need to consider what are all the consequences of, of what is being done. And uh, uh, so uh, that's uh, all I want to say at the moment, and I look forward to hearing what everybody else is going to say. And these are some, these are just some books and papers on these sorts of general areas. Okay, thank you.